Hello everyone. Welcome back to Lakewood Alliance's online gathering. If this is your first time joining us, we would love to connect with you and let you know more about the Lakewood Alliance community. So on this page around me, there is a new here button. Click on that button and we'll get more information for you. By the way, my name is Don Isaac and I am the children youth pastor here at the church. And this morning I get to be your host. We are so glad that you are joining us on this Mother's Day weekend, and we'd love to hear where you're tuning in from. So in the chat box beside me, be sure to say hello and let us know where you are this morning. Here at Lakewood, we have one simple mission. It's to introduce people to Jesus and lead them step by step in a growing relationship with him. Every part of this online gathering is designed with you in mind to help you take that next step in your journey of faith. We will start with some songs, led by the worship team, and then hear a message from Pastor Dave about the coming of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts. So, grab a coffee or a tea and get comfortable. We hope the next few minutes are refreshing and will inspire you to take your next step on your journey. Hello everyone, welcome to our Becoming Your Mom support group. Uh, we have some visitors with us today, welcome to you. My name is Mark and I'm the group leader. And I think we'll start by reciting our mission statement. We love our moms, but we are not our moms. We love our moms, but we are not our moms. Carol, would you mind starting us off this week? Hi everyone, I'm Carol. Hi Carol. I'm the oldest of three roommates and I'm turning into my mom. I clean up everything after them. I've even started doing their laundry. I talk to myself in the grocery store all the time. All of my status updates are just pictures of kids. I don't even have kids. Same, well, kids and recipes. The other day, I almost licked my finger and wiped the face of a total stranger. I keep saying words like garbage and tarje. What is that? I'll send a text to someone just to let them know I sent them an email. Well, how else would they know? Right? I mean, these shoes were on sale. What am I supposed to do? Not buy them? I call my husband my son's name. And sometimes I call my son the dog's name. I always tell people, I'll be like two minutes, then it'll be like an hour. <laughs> whoa, whoa, take it easy there. Shannon already has a tissue. We really don't need to offer her one. I do. Did you see how they let the momness overtake them? So you may not be able to avoid becoming your mom, but the key is to let the beautiful things about moms shine through in your life. The kindness, the caring, the compassion, the qualities that God gave moms when he created them. Oh, like when I text my friends, LOL, lots of love. That's not what LOL means. That's what my son told me it meant. LOL, lots of love. What else, what else would it mean? You know, I used to be an amazing dancer. Now when I dance, people just get embarrassed. Can I show you? Yeah, yeah. no, Carol. Oh, Carol, sit oh, down. Oh, it's not bad. Carol, please. One, two. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Lakewood this morning. I just asked that you guys would all stand up and join us in singing our first few songs here.
This morning I have two announcements for you. The first is kind of actually a fun challenge. We know that each one of you has got some kind of way of surviving this COVID-19 crisis. In the moments of social distancing, maybe too many family members at home, or not enough, we all have different things that we're using to cope through this time. So we would love to see your COVID-19 survivor pack, whatever that is for you. Take a picture of it, upload it to Instagram with the hashtag Lakewood Alliance Church on it, or upload it to our Facebook page. We want to see that and we're going to post them next week as part of our service. So let's see how you guys have been doing. The other announcement I have is about a seminar called Engage. As Christian believers, we are eyewitnesses to God's great rescue mission for humanity. Sharing the light is not about convincing people that we are right. It's about introducing our friends and neighbors to the King of all creation the one who loved them enough to give his life so that they might be restored in their relationship with him. But how do we do that in a world where people think with their feelings and view every opinion as equal and valid? Join Josiah Barton and Steve Swan with Youth for Christ and Edwin Drulo from Second Wind Ministries as together we explore the Great Commission in an ever-changing world. The Engage Seminar is starting on May 17th. It is running Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. for the four weeks. There is a sign-up for it, so check out the website for more details on that. Okay, one of the most awesome privileges we have is to come before the Lord in prayer. So we're going to spend some time in quiet moments before the Lord, bringing our stuff to Him from our week, and then we'll pray together. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for our time together. We thank you that even though we're scattered all over the place, that through your spirit we come together as one heart and one body to lift up our prayers and concerns to you. We thank you that as individuals we've laid our stuff down at your feet. And the stuff that we've done this week, that we've just confessed, Lord Jesus, that you have washed us clean and made us new for the concerns that we have for health and safety, for the concerns that we have for friends, family, and neighbors, Lord Jesus, we thank you that you know their stories and that you're actively moving in among their stories. And we ask, Lord, that they would see you and know you through it all. Father, we lift up our world to you. We thank you for the first responders and the, those that are working in the medical communities and they're working tirelessly in some countries night and day to be the hands and feet for those that need such great medical attention. Lord, we lift up our world leaders to you and we ask God that you give them wisdom of how to negotiate the, the weeks and months to come ahead of us. And God, that they would be divinely hearing from you and the things that you would have them do. And Lord, we thank you that it is our awesome privilege to continually lift them before you, asking God for their safety and for their health so that they might lead their countries well. Father, we thank you for those that share the good news of who you are. We thank you for the Peters and the work that they're doing. We ask, Lord Jesus, that they would feel your presence so strongly this morning, that they would know your love and care for them. And God, that that love and care that they know from you would be what is shining through them to their neighbors, to the people that they come in contact with. And that through the small interactions they have, that the people that they see them might know you in those even moments the briefest of moments. Lord, we lift up Josiah to you and the work he's doing with Youth for Christ. We ask, Lord Jesus, that as this is a new world and a different way to connect with youth, Lord, that you continue to grow his ministry, continue to grow the conversations and the connections that he's making with the youth of our city. And Lord, as things are getting more and more difficult mentally and emotionally for a lot of them, Father, would you uphold him, give him your strength, give him your mercy, and give him your ability to speak life and truth in each one's lives. And we ask, Lord, as we come to our time together, that you would speak through Dave, that the words that he's prepared in his heart, Lord, will be your words and not his own. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Well, good morning, church. It's so great to be with you again today as we continue on in digging into God's Word together. Last week, we started a brand new series called Acts, the Church Unleashed, where we see how the early church changed the world and really turned the powerful Roman Empire on its head. But how did it actually move from a small band of about 120 people to change an empire. Well, that's what we're going to dig into a little bit more today. Last week, we considered some of the proactive steps that Jesus took in preparing his disciples for what was to come and what they would be doing on mission for him. And we saw the disciples also taking some pretty proactive steps to get ready for what they would be doing once Jesus really got the ball rolling with this. Today, we get to see the second piece of this, as Jesus actually enacts his church. We're going to see Jesus do an incredible sign that's going to lead to a lot of wondering, uh, and then he's going to help them interpret what's going on in order to lead to a response and to start to build his church. Sign, word, and response. That's sort of the flow of what we're going to be looking at today. And we're going to see how Jesus used that to help form the earliest stages of the church and how he's continuing to use that pattern of showing us something, interpreting it through God's word, and offering a time of response in order to continue to call to us even today as he continues to build his church and bring his kingdom. So I want to encourage you to grab a Bible if you have one there with you. Put the scripture on the screen here for you as well so you can follow along, or if you want to use your electronic one there, feel free to do that. Uh, But let's dive in. We're going to be in Acts chapter 2 today, and we have quite a bit of reading to do, so let's get right to it, starting in verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya, near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, They asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they've had too much wine. Well, there's this incredible sign that starts off our text today, where we see a violent wind followed by this incredible descent of fire that that splits up into little tongues of fire that land on each of the disciples' head. And then there's a whole bunch of languages being spoken, languages that the disciples don't even know. And they're speaking in these languages. And the Jews that are outside of the house are hearing these Galileans, uneducated people really for the most part, speaking in their own languages. And they're wondering, how is this going on? What an incredible sign. But a sign in and of itself doesn't necessarily mean much. If we don't have a context or a way to interpret the sign, how do we know what it's about? You know, one of the things they do when you're starting to learn how to drive is they make sure you do a test on what the different road signs mean. Because it's pretty important when you're driving around, both for your own safety and the safety of everyone else around you, that you have a clue what road signs actually mean. Now, granted, there are still many people, particularly in our city, who seem to struggle with the difference between a merge and yield sign. But if if no one understood the signs, boy, would we be in trouble trying to drive around. And for us in life, a lot of times, I think there are signs that come our way that at times God may be using to try and say something to us. But again, 
we need some way to interpret those signs so that they actually have meaning. So they're not just random coincidences that happen to us. So I want to pause here for just a moment and invite you to interact a little bit and just share a moment when you feel God has given you a sign and what it looked like. So maybe just take a couple of lines or a sentence or two in the public chat and feel free to fire out a comment of how God has given you a sign in the past. Now, of course, the people who saw this incredible sign in Acts 2 uh, were wondering what this was about, too. We saw that in verse 12 and 13. You know, they're saying, what does this mean? Uh, are these people just drunk? Now, Peter, who was one of Jesus' closest friends and one of his followers, stands up and says this in verses 14 and 15. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. Wow, that's quite an explanation. They haven't even started drinking yet. It's far too early in the day. Uh, but Peter's point is, this is not what you think. This is not some random act. There is something significant going on. And so now, starting in verse 16, Peter is going to take them to God's word. Because God's word gives a context for helping them interpret so they can understand the meaning of the events that have taken place. So we're going to carry on in verse 16 all the way down to verse 36, which is a bit of a long section. So stick with me through this uh, because we will walk through it bit by bit to see how Peter forms his statement about the interpretation of what this sign means. So he says, no, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the glory, coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest in hope, because you will not, not abandon me to the realm of the dead. You will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence." Fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. So Peter looks at this sign and he takes these people to the word of God to help understand what it's about. And the big point of it is this. This is the summary statement he gets to at the end. The sign is the pouring out of the Holy Spirit on the followers of Jesus. And that was a sign given to demonstrate that Jesus has been confirmed by God 
as Lord and Messiah. Jesus is the one who is king. He is the one with authority over all things. As Jesus himself said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now there's lots to unpack in what Peter has to say about this and also some of the symbolism that comes along with it. So we'll start with Peter's explanation and then deal with some of the symbolism of what happened when the Spirit came on these people in the context of what God had said. But as we do that, I want to invite you to interact again and just ask, is there a time that God's Word helped you to understand your circumstances? Is there a time when God just brought his word to life in your life to help you understand what it was you were going through. Again, why don't you just take a moment and fire a short story or statement into the public chat as we carry on. So let's dig a little deeper into what it was that Peter said through this as he's unpacking this with the people who are listening about what has happened. Well, he says, first of all, that it is the Holy Spirit who has in fact been poured out. That is the sign you have seen. That's what's caused these languages to be spoken. That's what caused the flames of fire to descend on the heads of the disciples. And he does that by quoting from the prophet Joel that this is what was going to happen in the last days, that God would pour out his spirit on his people. But how did it happen? Why did this happen at this time? Well, Peter centers that all around the person of Jesus Christ. His life, his death, his resurrection, his exaltation, the authority he was given, and the fact that God gave him the Holy Spirit, whom then Jesus poured out onto his people. So here's how it worked. First of all, in verses 22 to 24, Peter walks them through how Jesus was among them, and he came among them and did all sorts of wonders and signs, casting out demons, healing people, which were all ways that he was accredited by God to his people. God showed his people who Jesus was by the signs and wonders, by the power and authority he had. And then, according to God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, Jesus was handed over to the people who, along with other wicked people, put him to death on the cross. That was according, though, to God's plan. And then again, God raised Jesus from the dead. He didn't let him stay dead. But Jesus, in fact, has been raised again to life. And that's when Peter moves to what David had said in prophecy about the Messiah, that the Messiah wouldn't actually decay in the grave, but rather would be raised again to new life. And he says that psalm that David wrote wasn't about David. David's dead. He's still in his tomb. This was something David was saying about the one who would come in his line, who would receive the promise God had given David to be on his throne forever. That would be the Messiah God's sent one. The Messiah would be the one who would not see decay in the grave, but would be raised again to new life. So now, Jesus has died, he's been raised again to life, but not only that, but in verses 32 and 33, Peter says that now Jesus has been exalted. As Jesus ascended to heaven, he's been exalted to God's right hand and been given authority. He's been anointed as king and Now Jesus has been given the Holy Spirit by the Father, and Jesus has in turn poured out that Holy Spirit on his followers, which is the sign that they've seen. That's how it happened. It all happened centered in the life, the death, the resurrection, and the exaltation of Jesus Christ. Now back to the big point. In verse 36, God made Jesus, whom you crucified, you Israelites, and honestly, As we're listening to this, because of our own sin, we were a part of that too, sending him to the cross. But God has made this same Jesus Lord and Messiah. Jesus is the one through whom God's kingdom is coming. This is the one that God planned to bring his kingdom of restoration and life through. It's all coming through Jesus, and he's going to do it through the work of the Holy Spirit that's now been poured out on his church. So the work of Jesus is continuing on through the Holy Spirit, through his church in the world. That's a lot. Uh, So we have the sign, the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, which now is understood by the word of God, that God had previously said the things that he had said 
help us understand and give meaning to what the sign was. And we see that it's all about Jesus now accomplishing his work through the Holy Spirit working through the church in the world. But I want to just pause before we get to the next piece uh, about the people's response, because we've had sign and word. But just before we get there, I want to pause for the symbolism of what happened when the Spirit was poured out on the people. Because there's a couple interesting pieces there, again, seen in the light of what we see in the rest of God's word. First of all, the symbol of the wind and the fire, both of which often represent for us in the Old Testament the presence of God among his people. With the fire, we saw it when the burning bush happened and Moses was standing there and God spoke out of the burning bush to Moses and called him to deliver his people out of Egypt. And then when his people were coming out of Egypt, God led them by day with a pillar of smoke and by night with a pillar of fire. God's presence among his people represented by fire. But then we also see his presence represented by the wind. When we see the winds coming together in the valley of dry bones in Ezekiel 37, and the wind comes and gives life to the mortal bodies of the dry bones who are there in the valley. We see it when there's the filling of the tabernacle in Exodus chapter 40, when God comes and fills that space where he will meet with his people. We see it again in 2 Chronicles 7 when he comes and fills the temple. Again, the place where he's going to meet with his people. And God's presence fills that place with power. Now what's amazing about all that is, when you think about this violent wind coming into this room, and then the flames coming down and dividing and landing on each of the disciples, what that represents is that God's presence is now going to be found among his people. God's new temple, the new place where he will dwell, the new place where heaven and earth meet, is going to be in the new covenant people of God, people who are now in relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Now that's incredible news for us these days, because what it means is that you don't have to go to a building to meet with God, which is great because most of our churches are closed anyways, so you can't really even come to the building right now. But that doesn't matter because as God's people, he is here with us. Paul actually said it this way in a letter he wrote to the church in Corinth. He said, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are the temple. You are the place where God resides. Now that is both an incredible privilege that we can actually have the presence of God dwelling with us right here. It is also a sobering responsibility to think about how we choose to live our life as a temple of the Holy Spirit. So as followers of Jesus, then, we are to be Jesus-centered, Spirit-filled people who now are called into being a community in Jesus. And that's the other piece of symbolism that comes to us as we see these events play out in Acts 2 with this sign of the giving of the Spirit. You'll notice that When the Spirit was given, there was a whole bunch of people from all over the empire who were also there to hear these different languages being spoken, which were their languages from where they were from. These were all Jews, whether ethnic Jews or conversion Jews, who had gathered in Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost. And they are representative here of being a symbol of reunification within the people of God. That was a part of God's covenant promise to his people, is that in these days, the Messiah would be one who would bring back together the people of God. And now, as this community that's being formed by Jesus through the Holy Spirit, we're seeing a reunification of the people of God into a God-filled community. God is doing some incredible things to bring us back and fulfill his promises to his people. So, we have sign, the sign of the giving of the Spirit, and the sign of bringing people together in community. We have the word that helps to interpret what that's about. Seeing Jesus as Lord and Messiah over this community who poured out his Spirit in order to continue his kingdom work in the world through his people, the church. And now, we have the response. And, you know, the people who heard this first sermon by Peter had such a great reaction to it. Verse 37. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? 
what do we do? Now that we know that Jesus has been made Lord and Messiah, what do we do with that? Well, Peter has a very straightforward answer in verses 38 to 40. Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So first of all, two actions that they're called to do. What shall we do? Peter says, repent. Repent of your sin. Repent of following the ways of the world. Repent of choosing to go a way other than God's way. Repent and be baptized. Do this outward symbol that represents what's going on inside, that you're choosing to follow Jesus Christ. And as you do these two things, as you repent and are baptized, there's two blessings that come your way. First of all, there's forgiveness of your sin. As you have faith in Jesus and as you repent and are baptized, you're forgiven. And not only are you forgiven, you also will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. God's presence will dwell with you. What an incredible gift. So what do we do? We'll repent and be baptized so you can receive forgiveness and the presence of the Holy Spirit with you. And then we see what actually happened as the people heard this answer from Peter. Verse 41, Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles, All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. Those who accepted this message about Jesus were baptized. They repented and they were baptized. They were forgiven. They received the Holy Spirit. And we see in the verses immediately following how they're formed into this Jesus-centered, Spirit-filled community. Loving one another, caring for one another's needs. It's important to note, though, I think, that not everyone accepted the message. Those who accepted it, this was their experience. But those who didn't accept it carried on as before missing out on this incredible message of grace. And this is a significant message for us throughout the book of Acts, that you know, no matter what the message is that's preached about Jesus, no matter how God confirms it with signs and wonders and incredible things that would you'd think would show people the absolute validity of this message, there are still those who will choose to reject it. So the people are called to response. There's this amazing sign, this understanding and meaning that comes from seeing the sign through the lens of God's word. And there's an opportunity to respond, but it's still just an opportunity. And as people respond positively to this message, we see that it's not just the people's response, but God also responds to them. We've already seen the two blessings that God gives them, of forgiveness and the gift of the Holy Spirit. But in in verse 47, the second part, it also says that the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. God continued to bring more people into this loving, grace-filled, spirit-filled community. God continued to bring people in who would accept and receive the message of Jesus and build up his church in order to impact the world with this message of hope. Now, as a church, our vision statement over the last few years has been, I will build my church. The words that Jesus actually spoke to his followers. He said, I will build my church and the gates of Hades itself will not stand against it. Jesus, in this moment in Acts chapter 2, actually enacts his church by the pouring out of this incredible sign, the giving of the Holy Spirit, which is understood through the word to confirm that Jesus is actually the one who is King, the one who is Lord and Messiah, and gives his people an opportunity to respond. 
to come into this community of faith, to be his church. And Jesus is still building his church today. And maybe especially in these days. You know, in these days, there is such an incredible sense of a profound sign that God's giving us to try and get our attention. Uh, Whether it's the sign of the pandemic or other signs that we see around us, we have opportunity to see God at work if we'll only understand it through the lens of his word. You know, in in the Islamic world, oftentimes we hear stories of dramatic signs they receive, of, of visions of Jesus or dreams of Jesus coming to them. Sometimes in our lives, maybe the signs are a little more subtle. Maybe things that just seem like coincidence or circumstances. But when understood in light of what God's doing, we can see that actually God is initiating a relationship with us. God's trying to get our attention to show us that the way of the world is not working and that he's inviting us into his kingdom through belief in Jesus Christ. And as always, you know, we as a church have such a great opportunity to explain that, to share the word part of this, to give understanding and meaning to the sign that people are experiencing. And if you're experiencing one of these signs right now, something that you just feel God's stirring in you, Come to God's word. Come to him in prayer. Ask him what it's about. And allow him to unpack that and show you and interpret that through his word so that sign has meaning in your life. Because you have an opportunity to respond to him. To respond in faith and experience the blessing that God has for you. God is trying to get our attention these days so that we too will know that Jesus is Lord and Messiah. We're going to take a little bit of time for our response in just a few minutes, Uh, but why don't we just take a moment and pray, and then I'll explain what we'll be doing. Father, thank you so much that in this moment in Acts 2 that we've read about today, you actually began your church. And the church really isn't something that's just a religion. It's not something that we come to on our own, Lord. This is something that you actually are building. As you pour out your spirit, as you call people to yourself, you are building your church. God, as you have spoken to us today, as you are working in our lives and as you are giving meaning to what you're doing, God, help us to respond positively to experience your grace. Help us not to be people who miss it and continue on with life the way it was. But Lord, may we be people who respond positively to you and experience your grace and your love. We thank you for that in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. Well, like I said, every Sunday, uh, what we do following the message is take a bit of time just to process with God what it is that we feel he's been saying to us today. And so we do that in a few ways. Um, There's always the the band that comes up and plays again and leads us in some songs. So feel free to sing along with those. Uh, Maybe just spend some time giving thanks to God or processing through with the words of those songs, something that God's stirring inside of you. There's always the opportunity to give. Uh, You can click on the donate button and just give back a part of what God's given to you back to him today. And there's instructions once you click on that button of how to do that. And and there's always the opportunity for prayer. Uh, If you would just like to pray quietly in your home, you're welcome to do that. If you would like someone to pray with you, uh, we're getting more of our prayer team online with us as well. So we're excited about that. And if you click on the live prayer button, there will be someone to do a prayer chat with you. And if you would like to actually do something more live, maybe after the service, see if you can arrange either a phone call or video call with them. And I know they would love to actually be able to pray personally with you. But let's take some time and just spend it with God, working through whatever it is he's doing in us today.
would just like to read this verse kind of as um, an encouragement to the church today. So it comes from Romans 8, verse 26. And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we do not know what God wants us to pray for. But the Holy Spirit prays for us with groans that cannot be expressed in words. So just as we sing this next song here, I'd just like you guys to really um, just think through those words and let that um, wash over you as an encouragement today. There's nothing worth more that I'll ever come close. Nothing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of
to come before you as one body and one community and one church, God. And I thank you that no matter um, where we are today, we're um, in our, all in our different homes and different places, God, I thank you that even there your Holy Spirit meets us, God, and that even there we can be reached by you, and that even there where we feel alone, that you are present, God, and you are with us. And I just pray that as we leave this place, we would um, not leave you with this idea of church, God, but that we would take you with us through our day and that we would take you with us through this week. Yeah. I pray this all in your name. together church and just really praise our God. This morning's benediction is a little different. Just in Acts chapter 2, as everyone spoke in many different languages and heard the truth of God spoken to them in their own tongue, we thought it'd be so neat for you to hear the benediction from Numbers chapter 6, spoken in many different languages, as a blessing over you as we finish our time together. God bless you, church. El Señor te bendiga y te guarde. Ivorekaka Adonai Veyesmerica. Nahai Hospud Poblo Hosilverte Bear, in Nahai Vin Tobi Stedojai. 
Der Herr segne dich und behüte dich. Chitabo chokubala, olunyi didiru wa mkaga, esula abidi munya, paka kwa abidi mkaga. Ya Adonai panav aleka ve yakunika. Der Herr lasse sein Angesicht leuchten über dir und sei dir gnädig. Mukama akuwa mkisa, mukama akukume, mukama akuakize amasoge, akuatirwe echisa. El Señor te mire con agrado y te extienda su amor. Der Herr hebe sein Angesicht über dich und gebe dir Frieden. Nachai hosputz vernatze na tabe letza swoye i nachai das to be mer. Mukama akui musize amasoge akue emirembe. Mukama ba womksa God bless you. El Señor te muestre su favor y haga resplandecer su rostro sobre ti. Amén. Y sa Adonai panav alika veyasem lacha shalom. Veyasem lacha shalom.